so I really appreciate uh, the platform you are establishing. It's by itself is very innovative and also encouraging. Uh, in your conclusion, uh, the point, uh, one of the, your conclusion is embedding gender or mainstreaming gender in the entire program structure of each country or programs or what have you. I think at this time, most of the countries have, you know, this kind of embedding or mainstreaming, what have you. The problem is the how part. I believe women have their own strategic approach or methods or modules maybe, quite different from men. So how we could really just minimize that gap? Because every, every country, every program have their own mainstreaming, but as I said, ground level implementation is lacking because of the how part. So how you you'd think this can be addressed? The second one is you mentioned increasing income, generating opportunities for women. So have you really measure, measured or did any assessment uh, in terms of income change uh, between those groups you have established a platform uh, as compared to the groups which you don't, you don't have that chance? Is there really any, any, any impact as such visible impact because in most cases people are or especially the government are really convinced that whenever we provide data figures they are convinced and then go for expanding that kind of approach in their system that is uh, their question the third one is maybe is a platform also works for use group the platform you established also work for youth groups because when we say gender, it does address also women, uses, girls, and what have you. Thank you very much. These principles sound great, but practically how do we do this? Um, excellent question. Um, okay, so we can go about this two ways. I'm curious actually to hear from you what what specifically is you know the, the point of friction that you're experiencing? What is the challenge? Because it sounds like you've got something very specific in mind. Um, but in the abscess, uh, absence of being able to have a full conversation, there's a few things that I think very often, often work. So let's say we've got a generic platform and you see that women are not sufficiently signing up and are not using the platform as um, you know, much as their male counterparts. So a few things. One, absolutely crucial that tech and touch, um, you know, that human touch um, element, absolutely crucial um, for, you know, what we see in various contexts with various organizations. Um, I don't want to generalize because before you know it, we're all going to run around saying, Women love relationships and men don't like relationships as much. That's not true. That's not like 100% a fact. But um, I am going to risk generalizing a little bit. On average, in general, we do see that women customers tend to value those relationships and those human elements a lot. So you can't expect to onboard them just with you know, your, um, your app or whatever the case might be. In addition to that human element, bring in women agents. And this seems like a very simple piece of advice, but it is a beast to tackle. I'm sure I see a lot of people nodding their heads. Everybody that, I think anybody that uh, tries to work with a, a sales force or field-based agents and is trying to make sure that a lot of them are women runs into many issues from mobility to social norms that limit that etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so that is one seemingly simple piece of advice make sure that you bring in women agents um, and underneath that um, uh, th there's a lot so how do you recruit them are you speaking just to the individual women are you taking a bit of a community-based approach are you saying let's sit down with you and your family or you and your husband so we can explain to the whole family why it's beneficial for um, this woman to take on this role do you provide stipends for transport do you um, maybe help people get motorcycle licenses do you wh what do you have in place for security um, what is even you know even practically, what is the radius in which you are expecting an agent to operate? And how big is that radius? And can you maybe look and indicate smaller radiuses for all of your agents so that they can physically make it out 
to their entire field and back home in time before dark. So all of those practical things. Um, and then um, a second part that you mentioned, oh, sorry, a second part that I would um, respond to to your question, how do we practically make sure that we include more women on our platforms, is to um, design our um, interfaces and our engagements for lower uh, digital and what is it, alphabetic literacy contexts. Um, so to really think about, can our app be operated with voice? W which language does our app operate in, first of all? Um, and um, can we use icons and pictures and emojis rather than um, text? Also, how complex is the text? Those kinds of things. Um, just to avoid the kind of... Um, but what you'll see, and again, I'm risking generalizing here, but what you'll see in general is that a, the, a hurdle that's in place for women customers to start using such digital services is that they feel like, ah, this is not for me, this is what the kids use, or this is what my husband, he uses it on his smartphone, it's a bit complex for me. So you want to break down that hurdle and um, make it... Um, feel less scary also um, and give people the confidence that they can use this um, on their own. So those are two seemingly simple things, but there's a lot underneath that that I'll give you. Then, whoops, your other questions. Have we actually calculated the impact on women's income? As part of this project, no. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done that, but I would actually like to, for example, ask Farai, who works with, um, you, you mentioned some of the impacts um, on the livelihoods of your agents, right? So I'd love to maybe pose the question to you, if I can. Um, there, there is ample research out there also that we can direct you. If you scanned the QR code, there's a few other links um, that you'll get. So. I didn't do it, other people have done it. Um, and finally, you mentioned, does the platform we've established also include youth? So this particular research didn't focus on youth per se, um, but as I mentioned earlier to Alexis, a lot of these principles and lenses and ways of thinking, you can also apply to make sure that you include youth, right? So set yourself that target and then ask, you, ask yourself, where are the youth, where are they not, and where are we not reaching them? How can we fix those barriers? I hope that answers your question. Um, to put into context uh, the story of Copia, um, when, when it was established, it was selling essentially groceries. And um, the groceries were of interest to prim primarily the women who were looking after their family. And just from that context, I think that is the starting point of where we started seeing women actually wanting to become customers, but on a secondary level, then wanting to become agents. Um, and over time, it has morphed to the 40,000 agents across Kenya and Uganda. Um, but when you look at the dynamic itself, it's not necessarily that there is a direct initiative we have taken to say, let us go out and recruit women. What has happened is, and this goes exactly to the point, which is um, you have to create something that springs interest. And creating, providing the products that looked after their homes is exactly what created the opportunity for us. Um, and that has progressed into now even the employees. Majority of our employees, especially on the sales force, are actually women. And they speak together and they actually have unbundled the whole um, sort of conversation to make it comfortable for themselves. Young people, majority young people, are comfortable to interact, transact, uh, and, 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 and we're doing somewhere in the range of about 50,000 transactions a day, and all those transactions are effectively managed by a team of very young people and predominantly women. So it's, it's something that's just sprung out of interest and making it simple enough you know, um, making life easy is our tagline, and, and, and that's how we live. We make life easier for everyone. And that seems to resonate with, with, with all genders, with the young, and uh, it, it resonates then into the business transactions that we do on a daily basis. Okay, just a couple of small points. Uh, Shri, um, this is just an interesting uh, observation. If people don't know anything about uh, Sanskrit, Sri is a term of great respect. 
And I think you have the respect of myself and many of the people in this room for the work you've been doing. So thank you very much. Um, but my actual question is for, for Rene. Um, I'm actually, <laughs> well, I'm actually going to put you on the spot a little bit. Sorry, Sri. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I'm a project coordinator for... Uh, one of the things that I'm doing is for Africa Economic Research Consortia. It's a lot of academics uh, looking at research for policy making. And I've been working on a project on digital financial inclusion. And about f <coughs> four or five of the projects that uh, research papers that are being done have a significant gender component. And one of the things that uh, the academics are struggling with is turning econometrics into policy. So when it comes to talking about gender in a meaningful way. And I think that uh, people such as yourselves who've got real feet on the ground doing real things, some of your recommendations and thoughts are very, very practical. It's going to really help them to focus their extensive research on actually creating change if they can speak to people such as yourself. So I'd like to make a few connections if, if you'd be willing. Yes. My question is to Sri and, and a little bit to, to Rene. Rene. <laughs> uh, uh, over the last few years, at least 10 years or so, there's been so much focus on these digital platforms and the platform-based economy and, and all the stuff. And, um, and, and if you look at the, the, the platform-based economy, you, you realize that a lot of it is about domination. And the winner usually takes all. Uh, I, I don't know whether they are, uh, we should introspect a bit. Uh, and and what, do we need, what safeguards do we need to put in place? Uh, how does the future look like for this platform-based economy that we are building? Um, so that's my question to Sri and of course to Rene. No, to Rene, uh, my question was different, sorry. Uh, it was regarding the 40 to 50 percent uh, um, disaggregation that you uh, more or less uh, observed in the different platforms that you studied. Was that good or bad? Uh, because I didn't understand whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and what was the threshold? I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the social context that you're working in. In terms of platform, I think you're spot on there. The usual tendency is to start growing bigger, and then that leads to being a dominate, dominating position, whatever, yeah? And it has to be done very consciously, and that's the reason why we've also been moving very carefully on that path. Now, the question is, how do we do this? So if you remember, I was talking about the PPP strategy, with the platform being at the center. And there is also a reason why we are calling it one network, because all of us are looking for that one common thing. And we didn't say Kuza one network, no. But somebody had to do this, so we put up our hand to do this. And a lot of credit goes to some of the leading uh, mission aligned actors in the industry, within Kenya specifically. Like for example, the One Million Farmer Platform, then WFP Farm to Market Alliance, the Heifer International, there are a set of actors who have a shared vision, at least, at least now there's a shared vision. It took some time, and all of them are putting the resources together into a common pot. It's a good wishful thinking, but it takes a lot of convening and catalyzing and collaborating efforts, and that's a lot of effort. I lost quite some weight in doing this, and lost a lot of hair, uh, but I think you need some mad people to do this. And then, once people see the traction, then they follow suit. Now, within the platform economics, uh, it's extremely important to have very clear governance rules. It's extremely important. Again, this is one of the things that we are looking to start creating a set of uh, think tank around the platform model. And we have a great opportunity because we already have the one million farmer platform. We already have a set of actors. And it's always good to fail quickly, fail forward in a smaller market like Kenya where the ecosystem already, now it's maturing, I would say maturing, and it has taken quite some time. But it has to be very intentional, it has to be a deliberate thing, and it has to be aligned. Excellent. What I'll do is make sure I get the last question from here, and then Mariam, I actually have a question for you. I have three sets of questions. I mean, when we talk about in 2022, 
access to digital information, I don't think that's a problem per se from my perspective. It's not the main issue. When you're talking about building resilience, we tend to move beyond access to how you use that technology to help you cope, adapt, and thrive. Now, the conversation on scaling up any digital platform seems to be resting on the shoulders of access more and not necessarily on how farmers are using that technology and to what extent are we talking about change or impact on behavior. Which comes to the question now, uh, uh, Srim, allow me to pose it to you. How do you set up your monitoring system? When you talk about you've moved from a farmer base of 2,000 maybe to 50,000, are those new users? Are those second time users? And are you talking about the feedback loops that they give you, feedback in terms of the content? Is it changing their impact in terms of behavior? How do you set up your monitoring system so that you keep innovating and really interesting more on the impact and not just growing the numbers? Because to be honest, if you check all our phones, I think we have so many apps. And the question is, when was the last time you used five of those apps? So really, how do you set up your monitoring system to be able to track the impact you're having at behavioral level, not just access? Because it seems to be uh, some of the interventions seems to be subsidized. And if you remove the enabling environment, something changes. On the training, Georgina, I mean, there is so much content outside here. You just need to pick the app and everyone or anyone has a content on agronomic practices, fish practices, livestock, whatever it is. My question to you, Georgina, how do you work with government to really standardize some of those trainings? Because a farmer who only has two or three dollars has to make a decision on what exactly do I need to invest in and I need to be guaranteed that I will get the right outcome. Remember the risks are not with you but are with the farmer. How would or what sort of advice would you give governments so that they are able to really play a much more proactive role in ensuring standards and quality in the extension services that are offered digitally? In some cases, it's a copy paste of content from one to the other. And so farmers are really guaranteed that whatever you're putting your money, this has been tried and tested. What's the role of government? Because it seems to be subsidized a lot. Uh, and then to the chef of the house, the person who cooks to an audience of one. <laughs> My question to you is, uh, from, from a World Bank perspective, are you able just to share from your experience, which are those digital platforms that have really grown more than 10, 15, 20 years and really sustained that growth? What are those ingredients of, of, of sustaining uh, agri-tech in some of these areas? Because I'm really looking at if Africa is really to transform our food systems, most of those agri-techs would really need to be self-sustaining. So happy to hear some of your thoughts. Thank um, so actually, I think your first few questions uh, can, I can answer in one, really, because I think the answer to the second one is, is the first one. So um, your first question was around how do you monitor whether content is any good? And your second one is like, how do you create great content? And the answer is how you create, to how you create great content is to monitor what really happens. And the people we see do this the best tend to be the private sector companies that we work with. And, and the reason is, is quite simple, right? Because they are, the ones who do, do this really well, are absolutely laser focused on behavior change. And the reason for that is because, you know, for some of them that is life or death. You know, they need, they need to see behavior change among their field staff, they need to see behavior change amongst their outgrowers, or they won't survive as a business. So, and, and on, on the flip side, you know, if they're creating really great content, they can be looking at, you know, sales uplift of a few percentage points could result in, you know, quite literally million dollars, millions of dollars in, in revenue, right? So they are absolutely laser focused on how do you drive behavior change? So that's why we're often quite excited with working with those organizations. And I think that's where they're a great test bed for a lot of the content that gets created. So what we're excited about is partnering with the kind of the, the experts on the ground, the people who can really kind of verify that content is accurate and then to inject that content into private sector organizations who can then iterate on that content. You know, some of the organizations we work with are iterating content 
on a monthly, if not weekly basis, you know, because they're analyzing that to understand what's really happening. So I think there's a, there's a, like an amazing synergy we can find here. Um, in terms of your point around government, we've actually never worked with government. We've worked with private sector and with kind of third sector organizations. It's potentially interesting for us in future. It's not something we've explored yet, but we'd be really interested to see sort of in future how we might be able to kind of take some of that content and think about how we do it kind of through state actors. But yeah. Excellent. So maybe Renee, did you want to respond to the econometrics research into policy related to gender? Mm, that, that one I responded to. Ah, yes. great. So, good. I think we're good. Sorry, it was still open in my book. So I wanted to go to Mariam to answer the scale because it's related to yours and maybe sure. we hear from her and Apex. Okay. Um, interesting. <laughs> so for us, I think when we started, um, it was like, who is this new guy in the market? Same solution, same old story. Um, so we needed to prove ourselves. So the first thing we did was to say, of all the problems that farmers face, which is the most critical one? Which is the one that if I solve for this farmer, I become a friend in, in his sight. And then we realized it was storage, right? Storage because a lot of time, the average farmer will lose about 20% post harvest within three months if he doesn't have proper story. So we picked that and then we solved for that, which was also very expensive because of, you know, setting up warehouses and you're trying to make that very close to the farmer. But when we cracked that, we then realized that in order to scale to the level we're going to, sorry, let me backtrack a bit. So we used to also use the um, field extension model, which is similar to what you do, sir. But um, this time around, we recruited them. So I'm going to be having a conversation with you to know if we can outsource later on. But we recruited them and then, you know, gave them everything they needed and tried to say one person to like 400 farmers, know this person, know their wife's name, know their children's name, go beyond the transaction and create a personal connection. Um, to be honest, um, Renee, in terms of bringing women into the whole um, platform model is expensive in the short term. In agriculture, a lot of the margins are very small. So you want to leverage on economies of scale. If I need to train five thousand people at once I want to make sure they are all there but then when you're deliberate as an organization about you know making those changes simple things like the period you put your training is important is it the time when she'll be taking her children to school or she has to pick her children to school we saw that making those little changes really help you know influence women to be um, open to us um, in the short term is not profitable because you need to customize solutions to them but the moment you get it they are very influential women will influence their husband their friends and and all of that so it's a deliberate journey that you have to pay for in the short term and hopefully it goes in the long term um, but just speaking back to um, when it was time to scale, we realized that we couldn't do this alone. We don't even have the funds. So what we did was we created a model called the ASP model, agri service providers. And we looked for um, organizations that were already doing something small along the value chain. And then we said, you know what, take our technology free of charge, software as a service. With this technology, you can aggregate your farmer model, you can create your farmer's digital identity, but you know, um, we can even give you access to capital. If you go through, if you go by yourself to raise fund, they're going to either say, go out, go outside or give you very ridiculous rate. But if I go and raise fund on your behalf, I can cut down the rates that you're going to get. So we created a lot of those guys within our ec ecosystem, gave them the technology, access to capital, and you know, um, in return, most of them, you can see a significant um, increase in their business operations and in turn, we benefit because they also sometimes choose to sell to us or sell through our platform where processors are there and they have that, you know, you have both the buy side and the sell side all together in one place and then there's fair pricing. So that's pretty much Excellent. I mean, Excellent. So, yes, I want to give you a chance to respond. Do you want to respond? Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to pick on one thing that you mentioned around, you know, in the short term, it's an investment and not necessarily profitable to make some of these adjustments. Um, and it's so interesting because that's one thing that came up for me when the gentleman from FSD, I don't know if it's Kenya or Africa, but one of the FSDs um, spoke about this drive for domination in platforms, right? What came to mind for me at that point is that a lot of it also goes back to what are the incentives and what are the things that the powers that be with the money, the investors, 
what they expect. And if what they're pushing organizations for is this super rapid, super rapid growth, um, uh, you know, year on year on year, that's going to push you to focus on your the, 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 the easiest to reach market. And very often that is not necessarily going to be the women. Um, so for me, to, to an extent, that comes back to, re and this is something that was mentioned this morning um, on the panel about gender inclusion as well, is we need to actually think about doing business a little bit differently because, as you mentioned, and as very many of the organizations that we work with mention, once you've you know made the investment, brought the women on board as either agents or you've gone a bit deeper to bring them on as customers or as employees, yes, it's an investment in the short run, but it pays off in business sustainability, long-term growth, deeper engagement, etc. But if your incentive and your push is going to be for that super affordable and rapid scaling, then that's not going to make sense for you. So I feel like for those of you in the room that have money and that can set these kinds of um, expectations and incentives, keep that in mind because I think that is that risks pushing organizations to avoid certain very impactful ways of doing business. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. So I just to answer your question, so first I'm not answering this on behalf of the World Bank, I'm answering as Vinay, and uh, I don't have a 15-year experience on the digital ag. I have to be very honest. My experience is four years. To answer your specific question, what do you think, which are the kind of platforms, which are the kind of ag tech uh, providers who will succeed? Based on my limited learning of four years, I think it's those who are really offering a very tangible service. So we have a lot of ag tech providers who are providing information. I think from our experience, we are seeing that those providers who are actually providing service as opposed to information. Farmers are willing to pay for it. And there's a lot more repeat kind of uh, 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 access for those uh, providers. So that's uh, whether it's a vaccination service, whether it's uh, a good quality input, whether it's access to credit or access to market. It's a tangible service providers, I think, are sustainable and people are willing to pay for it. If you allow me just one minute. Can I answer a question for Reni? <laughs> so I, I think on women agents, Reni, so before I came to Nairobi, I spent 10 years uh, uh, in the World Bank working for a women self-help groups project, leading a women self-help groups project uh, in a state called Bihar in India. And so there we had a million self-help groups, exclusively women, uh, saving close to $200 million dollars but accessing $1 billion from, from the financial institutions. And it was possible because more than 70% of the agents, which is there were 100,000 agents, uh, one agent managing tells and film groups, more than 70% of the agents were women agents. It's highly doable and it's been done before. And then I hand over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alexis.